So I think we're getting the signal that we're ready here. Yes. yes. Thumbs up. We're ready to talk. All right. So we can talk about what we're here to talk about. Hooray. Which is Dungeons and Dragons. Wait, first, mood lighting. Oh, really? Oh, oh wow. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> welcome to tonight's talk. So yeah, so welcome. So we're going to do uh, postmortem on fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. This is a talk we did at DigiPen. No, nope. but um, no, not Digi but This is a talk we're doing at DigiPen. We did it at Pax Dev. Thank you. So I'm Mike Merles. Uh, I'm the senior manager on D and D for the research and, de and design team at Wizards. And uh, on the game, I served as the lead designer, uh, one of the two lead designers. My main role was I kind of came up with the, the vision behind the game, like here are our goals, here's why we're doing this, and here's the purpose of it, uh, which is a big thing you know, in game design, kind of knowing where you want to go. Uh, it kind of goes back to something I said earlier, you know, if, you don't know, if you don't know really your audience, what you're trying to do, you're just kind of, you're wandering randomly and you're hoping to luck into something. So having that vision was really important, and also making sure it was the right vision. So that was probably my main design contribution, and I, I'd help work on specific mechanics but I was meaning the big picture strategic thinker on the game. Yeah. Uh, I'm Rodney Thompson. I am a designer uh, on Dungeons and Dragons and for 5th edition, I actually did a little bit of just about everything. Uh, I helped Mike come up with the initial vision for the game. I did a lot of this specific design in the books. I mean, if you look at the player's handbook, just about every class, I designed a large portion of those. Uh, I designed a lot of spells. Uh, and then late in the process, I was responsible for working with my partner in crime, uh, Peter Lee, doing the development work on the game. So a uh, little bit of everything for me. So we kind of broke this up into uh, things that worked in our process and things that didn't work. And then we end with something, actually, the, the final topic we're, we're going to hit on next week. Yeah. But so we're kind of going to guide you through th things we learned in making this game, what worked and what didn't. And so, uh, you know, the number one advantage we had was we're working with an established game. Now, obviously, if you're making a new game from scratch, you don't have this. We did, so we made a very concerted effort to leverage the strength in that we know what Dungeons & Dragons is. We weren't being asked to create a new genre. We weren't being asked to do something completely left field, out of the blue new. We were taking a game people were playing and releasing the new version of it, which had to have obviously, like, you know, things people could go, hey, this is an improvement. This makes you want to use... So I wanted to play the new version because it's solving problems I had with prior ones. And that was a big thing in bullet point one here, playing before we started designing. Since we knew what D&D was, it was pretty straightforward for us to just start playing D&D. We played every prior edition from the very original version up through uh, fourth uh, and basically took notes. You know, what was working, what wasn't. I think we had fun playing every edition. Yeah. I don't think there's a single edition no. where it's like, oh, this is terrible. How did people cope with this? They were all enjoyable. But I thought what was interesting was how they were enjoyable in very different ways. Yeah. That even the original version of D&D, &D, going back and playing it, well, there's, the rules that are there are cryptic. It's kind of like, it's more of, the, it's more of the, uh, a rumor of a game uh, in book form than an actual game you can play. The, um, but it's very liberating because in a way, when you start playing it, even having all of us having played D&D &D for years, entering into a mode where we didn't really know the rules because the DM had to make up so much stuff really kind of tapped back into that sort of primordial ooze that D&D came out of, of this is kind of a game where anything can happen. Yeah. The, uh, and I think that was very interesting because D&D had become very scripted. It was very mathematical. It was very much, okay, everything's going to be very regulated, rules for everything. Yeah. And going back to an environment where there are really no rules other than what the person who was the dungeon master decided, because again, there was literally no rules. It was just more of this yeah. sort of allegations and hints. The, uh, it was very liberating. It really, and I think I, I DM'd that session, yeah, remember right? you did. It really made me feel like DM as performer. I was basically, the player's interest in the game was determined by my ability to be interesting. There were really no mechanics I could fall back on. Like if you think in fourth, when I was running fourth edition, I could think, well, if I have a really interesting like fight here with some interesting terrain, I've kind of put some thought in ahead of time, the players, that can kind of occupy the players while I'm sort of playing the role of the monsters, which I may even have thought ahead of time, here's how the monster, what the monsters are going to do, I'm just here more to execute this. And that was great because it kind of gave me time to start thinking, well, what's the next scene going to be like? You know, I could start planning or really focus on the details. But the very early versions of D&D really required the dungeon master to be an entertainer. There really wasn't a lot of rules that, to help you, which was liberating on one hand, but I think on the other, as we've seen the game develop, that I, there was a gap. That was an area where we could help DMs. Yeah. I, I think actually one of the best things about this process was we'd all played every version of D&D before, but we'd never really sat down and played them all back to back to back, right? And so 
playing all these different editions of the game all in one sequence allowed us to see not only like how does this game work, but also what are the through lines that run through the game, right? Like what is the same about all these? Because we talk about like, oh, here's how OD&D is different. But there are a lot of things that you can see just a spark of this in every single edition, right? And so identifying those was a big part of our early process and sort of gave us our, uh, it was sort of our big uh, posts in the ground. We're like, okay, we know that you know, this game is going to have hit points because every version of the game has had hit points and they all kind of work basically the same way, right? I mean, it wasn't quite that cut and dry, right? But we, we were able to evaluate every version of D&D and it kind of showed us what are, the, what are the bones of D&D that are true no matter what skin has been put on the outside of it. So with that kind of knowledge, and you know, we went through and every edition had, a, had its insight it offered. And you could definitely see an arc toward a very freeform game early on to the game getting a little more scripted and then more and more scripted. And I think one of the things we ran into as the game got older was it was, getting, it was hard for, for people to get into because the rules, the mass of rules had grown so large. So a lot of fifth edition was, well, what can we pair out? And once we paired a lot of stuff out, then what do we need to reinforce to, to really bring some, something new to the table? And I think a lot of the emphasis on role playing in fifth with inspiration mechanic where if you are true to your character's personality, you can get a reward putting things like, well, what are your character's bonds to the world? That was stuff where we could see it coming up in play through all the additions, but the game had never really formally acknowledged them outside of alignment. And we kind of felt alignment was useful to the game, but asking people to use alignment as their, their only role-playing guide, as opposed to something a little more concrete, like you know, my, uh, my character owes a debt to this crime lord, and that's really motivating him, or something like that. It was a little too abstract. And so I think that's where one of the big changes we made in fifth came in was having that knowledge of how earlier editions had played and how we had kind of wanted to play them in, in some ways. You yeah. know, that role playing was always part of the game, but we really hadn't given it that structure. Not too much, but enough to get people in that direction. So. Yeah. So once we had uh, sort of identified our, our guideposts and figured out what is our, uh, what's our sort of target that we're aiming at, uh, one of the earliest things we did uh, once we got a core system working that we were happy with was uh, we built what's called the high wall around the game. And basically we said, okay, we've got these essential elements in the game. If anything else is going to enter our game, it has really got to pull its weight. It's got a high barrier to entry, right? And then we call it the high wall because it's like, okay, we're gatekeeping the core of our game because like Mike said, we wanted to make sure that the game was uh, approachable and accessible and easy to get into and easy to learn, right? And so every time you add something into the game, that's one more barrier that someone's going to have to cross before they can really understand the game, before they can really jump in and start playing. So we built this high wall around the core system, and that lasted us actually throughout the entire process. I mean, even as late as City Player's Handbook came out in August, right? So uh, even as late as I would say June, we were having arguments about putting things into the core system, right? It's like, is this a thing that can really that, that is really going to pull its weight and it's going to benefit us? the amount of complexity that's going to add to the game, right? And so one of Mike's big jobs was being uh, one of the gatekeepers of that high wall. Do you want yeah. to talk about what that was like? Yeah, and a lot of that was saying you have people who are playing a perfectly cromulent edition of D&D right now. Whichever edition they're playing, they're probably playing it because they like it. There aren't too many people who play games for dozens of hours because they hate it. Like we were just talking earlier, you know, what sometimes you hit a point in a game where you're just like, oh, forget it. But if you've been playing for a year or more, you probably like what you're playing. So it was very important for us if we added anything new, if we are saying, hey, we want you to stop playing D&D and spend some time reading a rule book, it had to be pure win. You just had to feel like this is good. Like every page, every hour I'm spending learning these new rules is going to result in I'm having more fun. The game's easier to play. It's more enjoyable. I get to do things I maybe wasn't able to do before, or I can do it in a way that's faster and easier. And one of the big things we had, one of the big requirements for any mechanic we added to the game was it was something that could do more than one thing. Yeah. It was something that would just fundamentally alter the game in a way that reduced the overall overhead of the rules. So it was like step one. Any rule that allowed us to pitch other rules was a rule we liked. And then the other side of that coin was it had to be a rule that either strengthened something the game already did well, so it made it work better, or it took something that the game either couldn't do or had done poorly and made it do it better. And not just, sorry, not just better. It had to do it well. It wasn't enough to go, uh, you know, People want faster combat. We made combat go from an hour to 45 minutes. No, that's still too slow. Like, we wanted a rule that could say, hey, combat can now, you can run combat in five or 10 minutes. Now, you can go longer if you want, but the changes we've made have really made a huge noticeable difference. Like, as soon as you start playing, 
like that, you'll say, okay, this is, this is definitely an improvement they made. So that was a lot of that sort of gatekeeping, was making sure we weren't essentially wasting people's time. We didn't want, hey, learn new rules and play a worse game. Like that's the worst situation we could be in. But we also didn't want to be in a position of, hey, learn new rules and play a slightly better game or a game that's about as good. A lot of our attitude was to think, you know what, if you're playing fourth edition or third edition or second edition, whatever, if you're having fun, we don't need to make you stop playing D&D. That's okay. If you wanted to play an older edition and keep playing it, that's fine. You're a D&D fan. That's, that's cool, right? We, a lot of our broader strategy was doing things like video games and other stuff, so we don't have to sell you a new player's handbook every five years. We're okay with selling you one once or having sold you one ten years ago, as long as you felt happy with Dungeons and & Dragons and Wizards of the Coast as the caretakers of the game. That was one of our goals. So we didn't want to get into an argument with people. But for people who were maybe interested in a new edition, it really had to have a real sense there was a real payoff there. So that was a lot of the thinking behind having sure. a very high standards for when we would actually go through and make changes. Yeah, I'll give you a good example of one of these polymath mechanics. Uh, we have the bonus action in the game, which is something we added pretty late, uh, and it was a response to the fact that we had a lot of mechanics throughout the playtesting process that were things like, okay, on your turn, whenever you do X, you can also do Y, right? And you get two or three of those on your character, all of a sudden when you do X, you're not just doing X and Y, you're actually doing X, Y, Z, Alpha, Beta, Cheesecake, et cetera, right? And so all of a sudden you've got these like turns that are taking five minutes, right? So we have uh, you know, the problem with loading in a bunch of actions all at once. But on the other hand, we have a lot of things in the game that are uh, not really great as a full action, right? It's like, well, we want this to have some cost to you, but do we really want to make you do this instead of casting a spell, or really want to make you do this instead of taking, uh, making an attack? Uh, so we draft the bonus action in, and we look at it as like, okay, this is not only our uh, action stacking prevention method, but it's also our way of saying, okay, these things that aren't quite enough to take up your full action. This is how we, we uh, get those into the game, again, without that sort of stacking issue. So we can see it solving a lot of problems, uh, speed of play, uh, mental complexity load, et cetera, and it all sort of combines together to say, okay, yeah, this is worthy of getting over the high wall. Yeah. So then our final point is a lot of what we changed and did differently were things that were invisible to the outside world because they dealt mainly with how we did things internally, like how we organized our teams, how we picked up on internal deadlines and, and, and uh, I guess how we would apportion out the project, things like that. Uh, up until recently, probably fifth edition, there was a real sense that in the design culture at Wizards for the D&D side of things, of the game designer's author, that the game designer kind of has his vision and everyone else is around there to help execute on that vision. And that's a really interesting thing because that can work very well, I think, if you're building a new game. Or if you're building a game, hey, this is the person who made the original, like if Gary Gygax or someone was still around, you know, still with us, you could see maybe that works because this is the guy who invented the game, you know. But when you have a game that has now its own community, where the people working on the game were not the people who originally created it, who may have just been working on it for five years or less since a 40-year-old game, you really need to have a sense that you've got to include the audience. Because one of our big things was instead of thinking, hey, we're like these authors and we be creative and kind of make what we want, we really kind of thought of ourselves more of like a, as, a ser as a service organization that we have users who are playing Dungeons and & Dragons, and they want a system that's more efficient, that does things they want to be able to do, does it faster, better, cheaper, all that other stuff. So rather than focusing on what's the new thing we can do, and this kind of ties back into the earlier points, rather than focusing on what's new, we're focusing on like what makes the game better for players. And that ties into a lot of the, 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 the results we got from our public playtesting. That was the really big drive behind that, was to really get in touch with our users. The, uh, to really understand, if you play Dungeons and Dragons, what does that mean? What role does the game play in your life? What do you like about the game? What frustrates you? Really zeroing in on what can we do to make the game better for the end user, rather than thinking what would be interesting, quite interesting. I mean, that definitely has a place, but especially when we're talking about system design, that's really where it's kind of like the boring grunt work of just you know shaving off those unnecessary steps. It's not necessarily the most you know, oh, really exciting, innovative work, but it's the stuff that seems to have, that can have real payoff for the people playing your game and using it. The, uh, yeah, our, our design had to be very need-driven, right? And need-driven design, you got to know needs, right? And you get those not from, you know, eight people sitting in an office in Renton, Washington, but the entire D&D community. So before we go a lot further, I have a couple quick questions. Does anybody here actually know that we did an open play test? Show of hands. Okay, cool, okay. super. So for those of you who didn't raise your hand, we did a big open play test where uh, 
hundreds of thousands of people were able to download the game before it came out, before it was finished, play test it, and submit feedback to us. And I'll be going over a little bit later uh, how that feedback process worked. But I just want to make sure everybody actually knew what was going on. Yeah, so that was a real change for us internally of how we thought about things. And it doesn't mean that doesn't have a place in our team. When we look at things like uh, adventures, stories, things that are more, maybe the things you do with the system, there's definitely a really important place for that. Because yeah. D&D is it's storytelling, and we need to be the good storytellers to match the storytelling that Dungeon Masters do. But when we're talking about the core system, a lot of that is just that kind of boring maintenance stuff, but it leads to a system that's leaner and faster and easier. So rather than getting sort of focused on the sort of the culture of design, there's more of that culture of, of utility mm -hmm. and really focusing on what are the end users doing and what can we do to make their lives easier. Do you want to touch on this? Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, so one of the things that worked was early on, we, uh, through the course of playing every edition of D&D, we identified what we call the three pillars of the game. And these are three things that you do in Dungeons and Dragons, sort of broken down into their simplest possible expression here in one and two word uh, phrases. Uh, these are things that we think are shared across every edition of D&D and really encompass uh, what we consider to be the iconic D&D experience. So having identified these as the essential pillars of the game, we then were able to look at our entire design process and every time we were designing something we were asking how is this serving one or ideally more than one pillar of our game, right? Now it's easy in in D and D especially uh, to look at the combat pillar, for example, and design a whole bunch of stuff for it. Right, I'm going to design a bunch of spells and attacks and you know uh, feats and stuff like that. But it was more difficult to look at it through the lens of exploration or social interaction and keep the focus on that balance. I mean, I think the end result speaks to the fact that from the point where we identified this early on all the way up through the release of the game, we had to constantly be asking ourselves, are we serving all these pillars in their appropriate ways? Now, that doesn't necessarily always mean that you have to have an equal number of game mechanics for every single pillar, right? When it comes to social interaction, for example, uh, we found that our audience uh, did not want a lot of uh, game mechanics governing social interaction. They wanted to role play out their character and talk in funny voices and maybe make a charisma check, but they didn't need a whole lot to feel satisfied with it. But what that meant was that we needed to serve that pillar of the game in different ways throughout the game, either through the occasional game mechanic or simply through the focus of the text or the amount of space that we're devoting to uh, you know, your role-playing traits. Uh, we did eventually end up adding in, you know, your ideal and your flaw and your bond and your personality traits. All these things that are very social interaction and role-playing centric, we ended up adding those in, but they're not highly mechanized, right? We just bring them into the spotlight. We focus in on them and that gives you um, that sort of satisfaction, or we think that gives you the satisfaction uh, that is due to each of these pillars. Yeah, I think uh, along those lines, you know, if you look at the character sheet for 5th edition, the real estate given over to combat yeah. is very intentionally the same size as the real estate given over to your character's personality. And for us, while the mechanics in combat are heavier, it's more that philosophical statement of this is important. It's important enough that it's right next to your armor class and hit points, and it takes up as much space, because this is one of the things that makes Dungeons and & Dragons and tabletop role-playing games different from other types of games. And it was important. It was clear, you know, in, with the open play test, it was important to players. They, it, this is something that people saw as, I want support for it, but like Rodney said, not necessarily huge elaborate systems, but just an acknowledgement that this is a key part of the game. Yeah. Uh, another good example for exploration. So when we were playing through every edition of the game, one of the things we found was that some editions were better than others at exploration. And not necessarily because they included a whole bunch of exploration mechanics, but simply the way that people played the game uh, as a result of the way that the rules talked about exploration. So one of the things that we did very early on, even before the very first playtest packet was, we made sure that the language we used to describe the way that you play the game makes it a more exploration focused game. So if you read uh, like a third or fourth edition rule book, for example, typically it'll say things like, you can make a perception check to blah, 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 right? Or you can make uh, a search check to yada, yada, right? One of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to break that pattern a little bit and instead say that you, the player, describe what you're doing and then the DM tells you what kind of check to make. 
And this is a very simple thing, and it, it's not an actual change to mechanics. It's more about changing the way that we present the flow of the game. And that little change ends up having a big impact because I'm not sit sitting here necessarily thinking, oh, okay, I want to make a perception check or a search check. I'm thinking, okay, I want to go and search that cabinet so that my DM asks me to make the investigation uh, check or something like that. And that's just a, a little way that we change the way that we talk about the game. We talk about the typical flow of a game that ends up having that big impact in the realm of exploration because now the just just the words we're using around the table. I'm going to search that cabinet. Oh, okay, you find this thing, right? That's a little bit different than I make a perception check. 25, okay, you find this thing. And it kind of keeps you engrossed in the world of the game in the way that, you know, just the purely mechanized version doesn't, right? Again, this is not a mechanical change, and a lot of people were, were probably already doing it this way, but we changed the way that we talk about it everywhere in the core system to make this the way you play D&D. Push on.